Hi there, good morning. My name is Otis Toussaint, and I'm coming to you live from uh, the Office of the Surgeon General here in Washington, D.C. Today, we're talking about the um, operational quality and safety in an operational environment. Uh, today, uh, it's the AUSA virtual conference, and I'd like to introduce you to an illustrious panel of Army leaders that are involved in the quality and safety of our Army. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you all to them, the entire panel. Well, actually, no, let's not go with the entire panel. Let's go first and foremost with our first uh, Colonel, Colonel uh, Tanya Dickerson. Hi, ma'am. Good, mor Good morning. Good morning. I'm Colonel Tanya Dickerson, Deputy Chief of Staff for Quality and Safety. On behalf of the entire Quality and Safety team, we are honored and excited to present today in this live panel centered around what the team has accomplished during COVID-19 and prior as we look at the role of quality and safety in the operational environment. We have two dynamic Army leaders and subject matter experts today who will be presenters on the panel. Colonel Bonnie Hartstein and Colonel Karen Smith. Additionally, our SMEs in our various quality and safety fields are also on the line. Today, we have three main goals. First, introduce our new programs that have been very instrumental in ensuring quality and safety is always at the forefront in everything we do, especially during COVID-19. Second, answer any questions you have about the presentation or a related topic. And third, display the importance of collaboration and communication. I am now going to turn it over to Colonel Hartstein and Colonel Smith to introduce themselves and present the presentation. We are honored and humbled to have been selected to present to you quality and safety in the operational environment. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for uh, adding on uh, those two personnel. First, we will go with uh, Colonel Bonnie Hartstein. Oh, 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 you're mute, you're mute. There Hi, you go. good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, I'm Colonel Bonnie Hartstein. I'm the director of the AMED Quality and Safety Center. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the innovations that we did in uh, quality and safety and specifically in the areas of credentialing and privileging, which are really an, a, an instrumental way to make sure that all the healthcare professionals um, who treat our patients are skilled, competent, and appropriately qualified to do that. Um, Otis, will you be able to show the slides while I'm talking? Because I can't see I them. am. I am, ma'am. Let's go ahead and Actually, before you go into the slides, ma'am, I'd like to at least have everyone get a chance to see the entire panel that we have today. Oh, and okay, then I'll, great. I'll, Thanks. We will jump right into the slides. So Super. Uh, I'd right. like to take the opportunity. Let me let me shift over to me real fast. I'd like to sh take the opportunity for everyone to see the illustrious panel that we have today. So here's a live shot of the entire panel that we've got going on today. Say hi, everyone. There you go. <laughs> Good morning, good morning to everyone. And we've got first in the shoot, we've got Colonel Hartstein. So let's go ahead and put her solo like that and then add her screen like this. Great, okay. So um, I'll get started here um, with, our, uh, with our presentation this morning. Um, if you can go to the first slide, next slide, please. Yes, ma'am. Great. So I'm going to go over credentialing and privileging specifically related to how it relates to readiness and, uh, and what we've done uh, in terms of the innovations we did in the space of COVID to get a process. Credentialing and privileging sometimes can take, if you're familiar with it, a long time. Um, and, and in COVID, they're really, we, we had to act fast. And so some of the work we had done in the past laid the foundation to enable the quick response that we needed in, in COVID to get the right people in the right places to do the right job um, and offer that fast uh, med medical support that was needed um, essentially worldwide. Next, next slide there. 
By training, I should mention I'm an emergency medicine physician. I'm the consultant to the Surgeon General in emergency medicine. So credentialing and privileging, like it, it, like any physician or any healthcare professional, is is something that you experience again and again in your career um, as you move from place to place. So I want to sort of set the stage here by establishing a few definitions so we're all on the same sheet of music. Credentialing and privileging, while they're said together and often used interchangeably, are actually two parts of a very distinct process. If you think about going to you know get your driver's license if you figure out your driver's license is your permission to drive um, on the streets of the state where you are um, that would be your privilege your credentials are all the documents that that validate your competency and show that you should be allowed to do the craft or the skill that you do so th these are your licensure your certifications your um, board certification, your uh, all the things, your residency certificates, all the things like you know your birth certificate, your driver's ed form of completion. These are your your items that show that you have that background to do it. Now, privileges um, involve validating all the credentials and also making sure that you're competent, you're competent, and you're skilled. And then it's the permission to actually deliver the medical care. And this is related in, in a large part to um, our accrediting agency, the Joint Commission, that's responsible for making sure that all of our, that we use it to validate the quality of our hospitals. And privileging um, is an important element of that quality. It, it ensures that the, the, the platform of care has the right, um, you've identified the right scope of care that can be supported by that platform of care and that the people working there have the right permissions to do the, the care that they can. If you take, for example, a transplant surgeon, not every hospital can support transplant surgery. So you may have the credentials to perform transplant surgery, but you don't have the privileges or the permission to do it in this hospital because we don't support it. So that's the way credentialing privileging kind of go hand in hand. Um, the privileging authority is the person um, who gives you that permission. So this is a very important uh, leader in the chain of credentialing and privileging. They give you the final green light. And, um, and that usually is the MTF or hospital commander in the, in the Navy. It's the fleet commander. And, the, and then I'll go over a little bit about the way the services do this differently. But we don't send doctors downrange um, or even into hospitals without giving them privileges. So this is a very important step to getting the medical care to where it needs to be. Um, quality oversight, this is the general world that we're gonna talk about in all aspects this morning. Uh, but this is all the things that we make sure that the quality of care you are, uh, the, the patient gets is, is, um, is sound, is good, is delivered by qualified individuals. And that's part of the essential um, front door of that organization of, of any organization is the credentialing and privileging. Who are you letting into your facility to see your patients and are they skilled and have you vetted them appropriately? And this happens in accordance with these regulations. Uh, so let's go on. So now that we're all on the same sheet of music with what it means to be credentialed and privileged, we're going to jump into, into the next slide here and go into um, the Army Reserves. So how does this relate to our Army Reserves and how does privileging tie to that absolute number one priority of readiness? Um, next slide here. The um, AMED Professional Management Command is a, a reserve command and they are responsible for that important step of credentialing all Army Reservists. So they gather all of the documents that the reservists need to make sure that they're ready to be privileged when they come on active duty. And this is an important distinction in the way that the Army was managing, is managing, and, and has, we're making some changes where we're trying to change in this space. But the Army had been traditionally in the res for the reserve component, and I'm not going to go into the National Guard. They do it a little bit different in the National Guard, but just focus on the reserves. They will credential all of the reservists, but not privilege them until they are orders, they have orders to go somewhere and do a mission. So that, um, that important extra step of privileging, so important in terms of being giving you the permission to see patient care, could sometimes take a long time. And that's an, and if you think that, you know, readiness is tied to your physical readiness in terms of being able to deploy, as well as your competency, to do your downrange job, this is yet that other step. You're not even allowed to do it until you're privileged. 
So let's go into the next slide here. This kind of sets the stage for the, the, the issue, the mission set, the problem set that we were facing. Um, in order for reservists to really be ready to, to pop and deploy, they have to be privileged. But we were waiting this step, this extra step of privileging, which was going through the, the MTF where the reservists were going to uh, deploy through. So the platform of deployment was the location where they were going to get privileged, where the hospital there and that privileging authority was going to grant them their permission. Now, they weren't going to work in the hospital, but they were going to take those privileges and work downrange. So it was a little bit, it's a, it, it, and it's it's still there, but we're, we have done a lot to, to create a different process because this process um, sort of put the most important step all the way to the end, and and it could become the rate limiting step of the most important item of getting on, you know, a situation getting on the plane, going downrange, doing your skill your skill set um, was tied to privileging, and privileging was um, too far downstream. So um, APMC would get all the documents together, the reservists would get orders, and go to the to the deployment platform, and that's when the privileging would happen. So we endeavored to create a process where we would privilege reservists before they even had orders. The Navy, the U.S. Navy does this where they take all of their reservists and without the pressure of a deployment, they're vetting them and giving them privileges so that when they're ready to go, they are ready to go. And that was the um, problem set and the solution that we were uh, trying to emulate. Next, next slide, please. So you can see here the Interfacility Credentials Transfer Brief is the document that initiates that privileging action. And the, the timeline that APMC was going off was, was 120 days beforehand, then 90 days. And all these things had to happen in order to send the right information to the MTF where the provider would be deploying through in order to get those privileges. But you can imagine not every conflict do you have the luxury of time. And certainly in the space of COVID, we all, we all said we did not. Next slide, please. So what we did was um, instead of having the active duty MTF commander be the privileging authority, we um, brainstormed and came up with uh, an idea to have the APMC commander be the privileging authority. And um, the Surgeon General then of the Army um, was able to then delegate that privileging authority to the APMC commander. Then reserve privileges would be privileged for deployment through the APMC commander. And, um, and then if they were going to work in an MTF, well, then because of joint commission requirements, they would have to be privileged by the MTF commander. But most of the time, that wasn't the case with the reservists. They were being deployed. Go to the next slide, please. And this is the delegation memo, and it's been reissued by um, uh, our, our most recent Surgeon General, General Dingle, but um, Lieutenant General West had signed one before this. Uh, next slide, please. So how did this, ha how did this go in, in, during COVID response? Well, we had already set the stage and already privileged a, a, a several, about 70 reservists to do their downrange mission. But when COVID hit, there was a need to rapidly spin up and deploy reservists to um, meet stateside and worldwide missions. Because the APMC commander had that delegation memo, the APMC commander was able to issue disaster privileges to activate reservists. Now, I'm going to go into in the rest of my presentation, what are disaster privileges and how were they leveraged to um, to mobilize a number of different uh, providers to do different things during COVID. But disaster privileges were one, are one means that are available to get people that permission to see patients very rapidly. But the caveat is you have to be a privileging authority to issue disaster privileges. You have to be able to have that approval authority. And we had luckily done this project and had the APMC commander staged as a privileging authority. That enabled rapid deployment of the reservists to meet this mission. And we still have, we have now this new process in place to support our centralized process, which we're getting spun up in terms of any um, response worldwide uh, regard re with reservists. Um, the, I, I will mention that the National Guard um, has privileges, but they have privileges to work in their state. So in order for them to deploy, we will be leveraging a similar process uh, into the future after we, we get this pilot off the ground with the reserves. 
Okay, next slide, please. So now let me talk about some innovations uh, in credentialing and privileging in general at the DHA. I was, during the time of COVID, had just been tasked to, um, uh, to serve as a, um, to serve in a capacity at the DHA leading up the credentialing and privileging um, uh, function there um, for a six month stint assigned to DHA. And that happened just at the same time that COVID hit. So we did a number of things quickly at DHA also to have the, to have the uh, that worked uh, to empower the entire MHS to spin up uh, during COVID in the way that it needed to. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna go over those credentialing and privileging process changes in support of COVID. So in, at the MTF level in, in medical care platforms or even uh, deployed platforms, there were a number of, of different processes that we put in place or changed to enable rapid sharing of providers, spin up of providers who were not um, already privileged to work, um, and then how to handle uh, those that needed to be repurposed and working at the top of their license or um, undergoing just-in-time training. We had to cross-level providers to work in ICUs. We had to take primary care providers or even specialty providers, put them in triage tents. There was a lot of rapid movement of medical professionals into areas that they may not otherwise have worked in. And that required um, some thinking through because we usually are pretty particular about giving permissions or privileges to work in a very specific area. In COVID, that whole thing got very challenged because we really needed to be able to leverage people against the skills that they may have learned a while ago, but were ready to kind of spin up and use um, in, in this emergency situation. Um, we had situations where we couldn't offer BLS and ACLS classes. These were important. These were uh, prerequisites to privileges, and if they expired during the normal course of one's um, practice in a normal non-COVID environment, that people would not be able to practice care. But clearly, we're not in the middle of a pandemic response, having or we weren't able to have regular. Um, BLS to recertification classes. Uh, we were having people's license come up for um, renewal and the state license board was not able to meet. Um, so this became a problem. Uh, we had to rapidly expand the capabilities of telemedicine. Uh, we had worked again another project to have centralized privileging for the space of the virtual medical center and that got accelerated and a jump start during COVID. And then uh, we also had situations where people's uh, privileges were going to expire. And then the delegation of the privileging authority. I explained during the reserves that the only uh, individual able to uh, award privileges is the privileging authority, and that's the MTF commander. Well, in this, in, during COVID, the MTF commanders had a lot on their plate, and we recognized this. And when it was all hands on deck, we had to allow a pop-off valve for the privileging authority to be able to delegate uh, privileging to another senior level uh, advisor in, in the chain of command so that uh, the privileging authority uh, could, the privileges could get awarded in the timely fashion that they needed to. And then, of course, when the balloon went up, we had to be able to disaster privilege people and get them into practice quickly if they weren't privileged and um, to extend those expiring privileges. But I have those on the other side of the uh, lightning bolt there to show that these were really um, only when the, and, and it didn't take long to get there, uh, but we, were, we did get into a place where these, which were only really reserved for the most dire of circumstances, well, we were pretty much there everywhere. Even if people weren't overrun with, with patients, we understood that the disaster plan, uh, even a portion of it, would enable uh, folks to start, or the privileging authorities to start issuing disaster privileges as needed. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over these in a little bit more detail each and just explain how they were utilized. A question came up, what if I um, train people to do something that they don't normally do? Uh, we're gonna be doing some just in time refresher training and um, asking uh, maybe ward nurses to work in the ICU, uh, maybe internists who are normally in practice in the, in the clinic to, to, to pull call in the um, intensive care units, maybe even manage ventilators. They haven't done it for a while. Well, there was a question, do we have to issue disaster privileges for this? What kind of documentation do we need? Um, and I'll show you on the next slide with the Joint Commission. There, there is a, me a me uh, mechanism and an allowed process 
during emergencies to um, expand within people's training and certification the work that they do. And so we said, no, stand down. Don't issue new privileges to everyone. That's a lot of paperwork that's not going to be used, that, that is um, going to be a distraction. Do the just in time training, get people where they need to do within the scope of their license, and, and, and that's going to be fine. Disaster privileges um, we used in the, when we had um, ret returning retirees. Uh, or in the reservists who didn't have privileges, but ha uh, but were having to work and be able to be per permitted to work quickly. So that there was a space for disaster privileges, and that was what we used disaster privileges. And then we also leveraged another uh, legacy Navy uh, process called privileging by proxy, which enables providers to move between platforms of care where they they would otherwise have to get privileged to just kind of show up and with the acceptance of the privileging authority with one signature to be able to use the privileges that they have to get into practice. And we um, were able to quickly stand this up for the Air Force and the Army. And then we had, of course, MHS providers who might have been returning to practice. Perhaps they were in administrative assignments. Uh, they hadn't practiced for years and they were able to be issued um, supervised privileges or disaster privileges if they didn't have privileges. The next slide, please. So this is just the Joint Commission's uh, regulation that says uh, that in an emergency, any staff member with clinical privileges is permitted to provide any type of patient care treatment and services necessary as life-saving uh, to prevent serious harm, regardless of his or her medical staff status or clinical privileges, provided the care, treatment, and services are within the scope of the individual's license. Next slide. Uh, privileging by proxy. So what is privileging by proxy? Privileging by proxy allows an institution to accept that privileging decision by a different privileging authority and pretty much get to work um, with the acceptance just of the local privileging authority. Privileging by proxy is authorized under our new procedural manual and we had been used by the Navy since 1994. Um, we also use it in telemedicine. And so we were able to um, replicate this, our actual electronic um, credentialing system, CCQOS did not support it for the Air Force and the Army, but I'll show you here in the next slides, we created some fillable forms that were able to kind of do that, that um, trail that we needed to, to, to do the right work um, to show the, the permissions that we were granting. Next slide, please. And here's the fillable form that we were able to um, rapidly put together and put on a SharePoint site and let people then, you know, within markets, the newly formed DHA markets, this turned out to be very important, especially in areas uh, like Hawaii and in the, in, in the Washington, D.C. area where they had to cross-level resources. This otherwise would have um, just been a bit more of a paper trail. Uh, and I know we're getting into a few of the details that, um, you know, you may say, well, you know, what does it matter? It's a pandemic. Let's just go ahead and do it. Well, that's true, and this enabled us to just go ahead and do it, but we do still have to adhere to uh, quality and, and safety and make sure we know who's working where and that they are who they are. You certainly wouldn't want um, not completely uh, imposters to be treating you, so we do have to still make sure that um, that quality is maintained. Uh, so here's our fillable form. Next slide, please. Um, we, you know, we, we did a lot of, of these new things, but, and, and so we wanted to make sure, though, that, that there was a tiered response and people weren't just jumping to these disaster privileges and um, necessarily without cross-leveling people that were known and vetted individuals. I mean, people were showing up um, at the doorstep of, of hospitals saying, like, I'd like, just like to help. And, and we wanted to make sure that we, we knew that that, that was going to be necessary if it was really all well, hands on deck. But with um, a worldwide medical staff, we were able, we, we should be able to cross level our folks and send people to places to help out. Um, and these were the way, this was how we asked uh, our commanders and our, our leadership to, to use a tiered response. So first you're going to cross level the folks that are in your own facility. Then you're going to privilege by proxy to add and share providers throughout regions and across regions if we need to. And then at the very last ditch, we'll do disaster privileges for civilians in the community who may want to give a helping hand uh, to an overrun hospital. So um, 
that was uh, something we, we also weren't clear to explain about. Uh, and then in operational units mobilized for COVID uh, without embedded privileging authority, we had to figure out how to quickly go stand those guys up. And that was where we were using uh, the disaster privileges for reservists and uh, pretty much any proof of identity would enable you to work um, in disaster privileging. And this was a joint commission um, uh, regulation that we were following. So that means if, if you're really um, completely at, at uh, DEFCON zero, you've got, you know, absolutely out of Schlitz, needing people from the community. If they show up with their Methodist badge, you could give them disaster privileges. Of course, this required um, a recheck, you know, starting to validate who that person was within 30 days of the work that they were, were starting. So there wasn't just a carte blanche. Anyone could treat patients, but we were getting close to that in some areas. And so we at least even had to address that. Next slide, please. Now, telemedicine, um, again, we said telemedicine became um, a really important tool during COVID response to extend care to patients um, at home and to protect physicians or providers who may not have needed to come into the office and face-to-face -face see patients. So how do you rapidly enable people to provide telemedicine? Well, in our current regulations, if you're going to see your own patients virtually, you don't have to do anything different. Um, uh, there is some telemedicine training that um, the Army has in place that just in introduces people to some of the, the technology, and we ask that people did that. But otherwise, just your own patients, no barrier. But if you're going to be leveraging um, cross-facility providers to see other people's patients or to provide even like remote tele-ICU, that all that it, by regulation requires a privileging action. Well, again, just like the reservists, luckily we had already led, leaned forward with the virtual medical center and created a centralized um, privileging authority through the virtual medical center. And in the space of COVID, this uh, was able to get accelerated. Um, so we, uh, one privilege through the virtual medical center would enable you then to see, um, to see patients uh, worldwide. Next slide, please. And here we have um, our tiered uh, telehealth um, for COVID, and this was uh, signed by Lieutenant General Place, um, enabling the rapid expansion of uh, telemedicine services during, during COVID as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this was the memo, this is just a little bit more about the delegation of the privileging authority where we enabled the privileging authority to um, be delegated within the MTFs to uh, individuals that were able to um, somewhat, another senior leader member appointed by the MTF director maintained in writing who was going to be able to grant, renew and extend privileges. Now this did not extend into the healthcare risk management section of the, uh, of the house and the responsibilities to do that were gonna be maintained by the privileging authority. Next slide, please. And then extension of licenses, I mentioned this. Some states were allowing providers to um, extend their privileges beyond their expiration date, and we as I also assisted with information related to that. Sorry, there may be a lot of dog barking. Someone's outside my house, and so we have a lot of activity suddenly this morning. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. I think that may bring us to the end. So um, I am going to now turn it over to um, Colonel Smith to talk about the Vital T program, and then I will be available for your questions um, at the end of our presentation. Good morning, everybody. My name is Colonel Karen Smith. I'm the Director of Patient Safety at the AMED Quality and Safety Center. I've had more than four years of experience in quality and safety, but I am also a physician by trade, a reconstructive urologist. And in 2009, I volunteered to deploy to Iraq, where I served as the OIF urology consultant. During that time, I received many calls from throughout that area of operation asking for assistance. But one particular call has always stood out for me. A female OBGYN or gynecologist deployed forward with an all-male line unit, 
trying to rule out testicular torsion or twisting, and this is a surgical emergency. Oh, and by the way, this was during a sandstorm where she could not air vac the patient. So at that moment, I became aware of the true risk associated with remote health care. The importance of that connection with the SME or the subject matter expert for both the provider and the patient and my, what my responsibility was as a leader. Years later, I was asking the same question for, from a quality and safety perspective. How can we improve access to subject matter experts for those in remote clinical settings in order to ensure the safest healthcare environment to our patients and staff? Today, I'd like to introduce you to our Vital T program, an innovative program which brings quality and safety experts to remote clinical sites utilizing the pre-existing virtual health platform. This program was originally developed and piloted within Regional Health Command Europe in order to address challenges with geographic remoteness of clinical sites and resource constraints potentially limiting access to quality and safety subject matter experts. And we originally developed this as a continuous survey readiness tool. We have since tailored this program to the theater environment, hence the vital T in the acronym, in order to maximize access of these remote deployed units to quality and safety subject matter experts, such as infection prevention and control, patient safety and medication safety, as well as others other subject matter experts, such as immunization healthcare management personnel, with the ultimate goal of enhancing the safety and readiness of our service members. You may notice that the acronym includes the word inspection, but the goal is enhanced access. How can we support those in remote healthcare settings in the operational environment? Not about inspection. Today, I will provide an overview of this program as well as some of our experience. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. But first, the why. Why is this important? As we move toward high reliability, harm prevention needs to move far forward at the site of first patient contact. Prevention of harm during healthcare delivery impacts patient safety, staff safety, and ultimately the overall readiness of our service members. We want to ensure that our service members don't develop infections from being in the hospital and don't have adverse events from a treatment. And we want to learn from those patient safety events that do occur so we can prevent that next event. We want to ensure a safe healthcare environment and keep service members in the fight, therefore preserving readiness. So we need to start with targeting high risk areas and processes. Next slide, please. The role of quality and safety in the operational environment is evolving. We know that it can have an impact on readiness and we are seeking to apply the same standards of care in the operational environment as in the garrison environment. Risks to patient and staff safety exist within the operational environment. For example, even before COVID-19, multi-drug resistant organisms were a threat in the deployed environment and have been for years. Quality and safe care delivery is one of the most important variables we can influence in this unpredictable setting. So we as leaders are responsible for providing these tools which maximize access of remote clinical sites to our subject matter experts because they are essential for the safety of our patients and staff. Next slide, please. This program was originally born out of challenges we recognized during preparation for a joint commission visit at one of our overseas military treatment facilities back in February, 2017. Achieving survey readiness was a challenge not only due to reasons experienced by most healthcare systems, such as lack of accountability, poor communication, et cetera, but also due to unique challenges we experienced due to our environment being geographically dispersed and resource constrained. Specifically, we needed to prepare not only at the main hospital, but also at six outlying Army Health Clinics located across three different countries. At that time, we also experienced loss of staff and TDY funds, so resource constraints. 
Our quality and safety lane therefore developed this program as one potential mitigating strategy. We subsequently conducted a successful proof of concept pilot focused on infection prevention and control and based on conducting virtual assessments of six remote clinics by an infection prevention and control subject matter expert located centrally. We demonstrated both savings of money and time. Our long-term vision, however, was to develop this for the operational environment as we knew that they had the same challenges as remote sites and we did just that. Next slide, please. So our original construct, how did we do this? We required a very basic setup, camera, laptop, plus or minus a rolling cart. And here we see the infection prevention and control subject matter expert is conducting the virtual site assisted visit from another location through the computer while designated POC at the remote clinical site maneuvers the camera. In theater, our options for connectivity have increased recently with the use of MC4 computers as well as other devices such as DX80s. Next slide, please. So our program currently offers virtual support in infection prevention and control. However, we've developed this also for patient safety as well as medication safety. The Vital T program currently offers the following services, not only virtual SAVs or site assisted visits, looking at patient care environment or process, but we've expanded this to help folks co do virtual coaching, education and or training on quality and safety and other subjects. We also offer virtual patient safety support to include support with patient safety events or root cause analysis so that we can get to the root cause of events and prevent them from happening again. During COVID-19 response, we modified our program even more to create on-demand service for those mobilized CONUS for the DISC emission, as well as, as those uh, located overseas. We added medication safety as a specialty, and we also added an email address and a 24-hour hotline, which I personally man. Next slide, please. The objectives of our program are as follows. We talked about improving access of remote clinical sites or operational units to subject matter experts. So essentially we are utilizing virtual health capabilities as a force multiplier of our assets. Facilitating learning via the link up capability. We know that multiple sites can dial in and learn from one event, one virtual event. We thought this was a very valuable potential tool for education, coaching, training for remote clinical sites. And for the last part of our original pilot, two sites dialed in at once, sharing information from each site, decreasing disruption to the mission at the host site due to an in-person SAV. We can execute spot checks at the originating site's convenience, saving time and money. Virtual Health for Direct Patient Care has shown this time and again, and we did as well with our pilot saving time and money due to TDY travel and loss of productivity, as well as being cost-effective, utilizing pre-existing equipment and technology, decreasing risk associated with travel within theater, and obviously ensuring continuity of access during travel restrictions as we've seen with COVID-19 outbreak. Next slide, please. So we are utilizing virtual health technology in a different way. Many of you are familiar with its use in direct patient care. As Dr. McVeigh stated yesterday in his address, techno we use technology as an enabler. We work hand in hand with virtual health to enhance and sustain readiness. We utilize the Cisco platform utilized in Europe for direct patient care, which provides us with a dependable and secure venue. Next slide, please. So as we tailored our original program for the operational environment, we considered possible interconnectivity scenarios and how we could best utilize them based in part on our experiences during the original pilot. Our vision was that Vital T would be a potentially valuable tool, not only for virtual assessments by a Kona space subject matter expert, but would also have value for intra theater consultation and education with sites supporting each other and multiple sites being able to dial in at once to share information. Next slide, please. 
So how would this actually work? What are the interconnectivity options and how could we utilize them in practice? So the location of the subject matter expert would be irrelevant. The site of the virtual site assisted visit could be at the role three under the direction of the Kona space subject matter expert in the States, or again, could be at the role two directed by the role three. The virtual SAV could be scheduled as directed by the SME or on demand. And the same construct could be used during virtual education, coaching with multiple sites dialing into one session. Next slide. One thing we have discovered over the years is that collaboration is key. And we have partnered with many entities to include virtual health, IT, JTS, combatant commands, and our sister services. During the COVID-19 outbreak, we were asked to partner with the DHA Tri-Service Infection Prevention and Control Tiger Team, allowing us to expand our service to the MTFs. This partnership allowed enhanced access to this joint team of subject matter experts in infection prevention and control, both in the operational environment and in garrison. Next slide, please. So we have demonstrated successful use of virtual technology to address potential risks associated with healthcare delivery within the operational environment, maximizing access to quality and safety experts through patient care virtual health capabilities. The Vital T program is a low cost, efficient and safe means to positively and proactively affect the physical strength and readiness of our war fighters with unlimited potential for future application within the joint operational environment. The way forward involves multi-organization, tri-service collaboration, utilizing available technology as an enabler in order to improve quality and safety during patient care delivery for both patients and staff, which will enhance and sustain readiness. We are one team for the patient, regardless of the uniform they wear. Next slide, please. So I thank you for your attention. We look forward to collaborating with you. And if we could go to the next slide, here's some contact information. And the final slide, subject to your questions, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Uh, let's see, I think everyone is back on. That was a really good presentation. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, for the presentation. And of course, if you're watching our discussion right now, go ahead and type your questions out and we will actually post your questions on the page as well and try to best address your question. If the question does not pertain to the discussion, we will um, ask you to email us a question and I will provide that information at a later time. Uh, so the first question that I have uh, for the panel is let's go ahead and post it uh what are some of the ways you can leverage virtual capabilities for patient safety in the operational environment thank you for that question that's an excellent question and i'm going to defer to my subject matter experts uh miss phyllis tor and or miss joan ruddle king um, to expand on that uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Joan Ruddle King. I'm one of the uh, nurse consultants uh, for the AMED Quality and so Safety Center. Uh, that's a great question. And I would have to say that what we have found in this journey using virtual health uh, to leverage our quality and safety, we have done so in so many venues. One is, one is through one is to actually um, use a, as a platform for team training to prevent events by building st uh, stronger teams. Uh, I know Ms. Phyllis Torrey, I don't think she was able to actually get onto our uh, platform today. Also, um, we use this to do coaching and uh, uh, across the enterprise, both in the operational environment and also within our facilities. Uh, we looked at, uh, we did uh, one root cause analysis, our first uh, virtual um, platform root cause analysis for an event. And this was very, very successful because it brought the subject matter experts together 
uh, the charter team that was looking at how to prevent and correct process issues, uh, again, to provide that quality and safe care. Um, other, other venues that we have looked at for COMPO 2 and 3 um, is to look into training venues with COMPO 2 and 3 to actually provide subject matter expertise to look within their their, uh, their uh, care environment setups and also to provide that on the spot so they're, they're not alone when they're looking at how to provide safer care. Uh, lastly, in some of the operational environments also to include uh, the COVID environments, providing that just-in-time training and then also follow up on the virtual venue. So I hope that kind of answered the question. If we have any other comments, over. Any other comments? Anyone wants to add to it? Go ahead and raise your hand and I'll uh, let you chime in. No one, no one. Okay, so we've got a second question. Let's go ahead and post the second question. It looks like the audience is also uh, do have, I see two comments there. So let's go ahead and see the second question is, how do we train individuals to manage infection prevention and control programs in an operational environment? Anyone who would like to join in with that? That's an excellent, another excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Helen Crouch, who is the Army Lead for Infection Prevention and Control. Ms. Crouch. Hi, uh, good morning to everyone. This is a fabulous question and interesting uh, because of our recent training. So there is currently a formal five-day infection prevention course specific to deployment or humanitarian missions that are held at TRADOC. That is held four times a year. And this was based on our previous deployments back in 2008 and nine, where we saw the need uh, to train people to manage the infection prevention and control programs. Now, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this deployment course was canceled and then the instructor was also deployed. So there was such a need from all three services that we did our first ever virtual course, just in time training. So it wasn't the full five day, but it was uh, hitting the key points to that course. We held it Monday through Friday in the afternoons through using uh, leveraging Microsoft Teams and leveraging that vi the Vital T program. We had all three services participating in our just-in-time training. We had all three services assisting us with that training. And we also had people in the area of operation throughout the world. Uh, we thought this new platform was a huge success and a model to use for future courses, uh, especially if people were unable to travel. We leveraged through the Microsoft team, we were able to work in groups, go to separate classrooms, work in our class scenarios as we were in person. We uh, continued to monitor what we're doing now through um, weekly call or once a month calls with our people in the AOR to assess uh, using the vital T, uh, their infection prevention. Thank you for the question. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ms. Crouch. Uh, so we have two questions on here. I'll, I see one from a Mr. Carpenter. He asks, how do I submit a question? Yesterday's panel didn't answer my question, but I answered everyone else to include it. I don't know the, con the continuity of what he's saying. Um, Mr. Carpenter, if you can send an inbox to us on Army Medicine, we will be able to directly answer your question. Thanks for your submission. And we have another question. Let's see if we can address this. It's, the question is, is there a plan to expand virtual visits with nursing patient, patient triage and acute care using nursing protocols? Can anyone answer this question? Um, you know, it, I think it's um, so we we teed up the virtual medical center to be able to expand, but they're really um, owning the space of the increased um, coordination for telemedicine services. So um, I, I think, you know, overall, there's been a definite increase in telemedicine 
across the MHS, um, but the specific strategy to expand uh, nursing patient triage and virtual visits, um, I, I can't speak to that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I think that is the end as far as questions that have been submitted on our pages. More than anything uh, to the panel, I just wanna thank everyone for participating in today's discussion. Uh, this is a needed uh, discussion. This is a first timer type of discussion, being that it's all virtual with AUSA. And I think we did a, all a great job. Um, if anyone has any closing remarks or comments, go ahead and feel free to share those closing remarks or comments. Anyone? Nope. Okay, I'll close it off, no problem. Uh, so I'm gonna say to everyone, just thank you for participating, of course. The Office of the Surgeon General, Lieutenant General uh, Dingle, thanks you for your medical expertise, participating in today's discussion. Feel free to share away this uh, podcast to anyone and everyone. Uh, they don't even have to be a medical uh, background. Share it, out, share it all around, share it to everyone. Let them be aware of the good things we've got going on here in Army Medicine. And I just wanna say thank you again to everyone. Thank, thank you. you, thanks for thank joining you. us this morning. Take care. Uh, all right, all right. I'm gonna go in the uh, solo mode real fast. Hold on, let's take that off. Put it back on me. And in closing, I wanna say thank you for participating in today's discussion. Uh, we have a few more panels going on today uh, to include uh, some command sergeants major and also another panel later on in the afternoon. Go ahead and check out the schedule that we have for Army Medicine in this AUSA virtual conference. And in closing, uh, in closing, I, as I always like to say, Army Medicine is Army strong.